So are we good? We're good. Welcome right. to the Mark right. Edit webinar series. The second webinar in this five webinar series will focus on working with non MARC data in Mark Edit, including understand, understanding Mark Edit's XML framework, adding new XML functions, and dealing with the limited data. Terry Reese is our presenter. He's the head of digital initiatives at The Ohio State University and is the creator and developer of Mark Edit. And I'll now turn over the mic to Terry. Okay, so um, before we get started, uh, <clears throat> just a quick uh, thank you. I'm going to start putting this on all the slides. So um, I'm sure some folks might have heard that uh, Carly is making these, available, these uh, webinars available publicly to anybody. Um, we're doing a little bit of um, uh, clean up on them to uh, anonymize them and take out the Q&A because those are really kind of locally focused. But um, I wanted to say thank you and I'm trying to make sure that anybody who finds them useful uh, uh, bounce that back out uh, to you guys. Um, the other thing is we're sharing my screen. Um, so what that's going to mean is I can't see the questions as they come in. So uh, if there are questions, hopefully they'll Somebody's going to just have to let me know when they get typed in if it's something we have to stop. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about, okay, great. We're going to talk about uh, working with non mark data. Uh, what I've decided to do is I've broken this into four sections. We'll spend the most time talking about um, the XML data and the delimited data, uh, but I wanted to cover um, at least quickly, um, and if we can't get through everything, I'll make sure that the slides get available. I think we can. I, I kind of ran through some timings. Um, we're going to cover how to extract tab delimited data, because this is a question that comes up quite often. I have mark records. I want to extract them out into some kind of report to review them later um, or maybe use the data somewhere else. Um, and then also working with uh, the Mark SQL Explorer. This is a tool that was added um, uh, for dealing with uh, uh, large Hattie Trust data, um, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 500 megabytes at the time. And it's uh, designed to um, either create a database from your MARC records for being able to do um, advanced queries and start looking at relationships between records and fields, uh, but also uh, is a way to pull data from other databases so the tool can connect to other database types and then pull data from it if, if you can tell the program where that mark data lives. So that's kind of the topics we're going to go through. Again, like last time, we're going to start with the slides and then I'll bounce out to the application because it's just going to be easier to, uh, especially for some of these things, to show you guys how this works. I have sample data uh, and if people are interested in the sample data, I can make that available later. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So working with XML data. So one of the things that um, uh, we tried to do, or I tried to do early on with Market, is Market. It was really kind of designed originally just as a, a Mark tool, but the the program has actually evolved quite a bit uh, as the, the kind of the, the metadata environment that we use here in libraries have changed. And one of the big changes has obviously been the use of uh, non-Mark. Uh, metadata formats, specifically XML-based formats, and the ways that we work with processing them. So as I mentioned in the in the last webinar, MarkEdit supports multiple ways to process XML data. So um, there are multiple XML processors to, that are supported in MarkEdit, which supports XSLT 1 and 2, XQuery 1, 2, and partially 3. Um, and the pars parsers can be configured. They can be configured as part of the preferences, so if we go to the preferences, there's the, the box here that this is the global setting for um, setting the XSLT engine that's going to be utilized. And when I say XSLT engine, this is also the XQuery engine supports both. Um, so you're either selecting the, uh, the MSXML engine, which is the engine that comes as part of the uh, .NET framework. Uh, it's been modified somewhat uh, by myself to make it a little bit more optimized for the kind of work that we do. Or the Saxon.NET framework, which is a .NET implementation uh, that the individual who works with Saxon has developed that provides uh, the XQuery 2 and partial 3 support as well as the XSLT uh, 2.0 support. So uh, you have some options with uh, doing uh, these XML crosswalks reasons for using one over the other at this point. 
the MSXML engine is, is slightly faster. So if you have XSLT processes that are generally 1.0 in nature, uh, or XQuery 1.0, the, the MSXSLT engine uh, is, is significantly faster for processing that data. The footprint's smaller, but for complex XSLT translations, or especially for XSLT 2.0, if you want to use the grouping constructs, which is actually quite nice, uh, then you'd want to use the Saxon.net. All right, and I'll show you how we individually, you can, you can do parser configuration globally, so that's through the preference settings, but you can also configure them individually, so by translation. And I'll show you um, here when I walk through how to create a new um, XSLT transformation, what that looks like. All right, so areas, current areas of support. So um, mark edit to XML support is, is right now uh, roughly into four general areas. In the mark tools um, functionality, which we looked at in the last webinar, um, there is functionality for taking mark data and turning it into an XML format. And an XML format can be um, either a library XML format or a non-library XML format. And then technically, it could be even a non-XML format. You could translate it into HTML or to a delimited format using a style sheet. But um, So generally, mark to some kind of an XML format. Um, through the mark tools, you can take an XSLT, an XSL, XML, sorry, XML format into another data form. Generally, that's marked, but it could be another XML format, or it could be, like I said, a delimited format or an HTML format. Uh, MarkEdit also supports native OMI, OMI, OAI PMH support. So that would be the supporting of uh, harvesting single or multiple resources at once. Uh, we'll go through this later in one of the other webinars, looking specifically at uh, how you can incorporate harvesting data from, say, like your institutional repository into MARC records that can be loaded into your library catalog. And this, like I said, can be done either harvesting a single uh, a single server or harvesting from mar multiple servers at once. Mark Edit has this concept of jobs that you can create, uh, jobs for harvesting data. And, and, and I'm at some point hoping to connect that job harvesting into some kind of a process that can be scheduled, like using the uh, Windows scheduler, or if you're on Linux, uh, cron tab, something that would allow you to uh, create a, uh, a process that could just be run on a regular basis that you would just show up to and your data would be in a folder. And then lastly, and this is new, is native RDF support. So uh, in the last year, one of the things that um, I use MarkEdit personally for is, is a, a research platform, uh, specifically around metadata. So since my job no longer involves cataloging or, or metadata in, in a strict sense, uh, but this is a, a research interest and something that I've, I've been interested for a long time and, and am involved in, um, the MarkEdit platform uh, becomes a way for me to conduct some of that research. And so one of the ways that I've been taking some of the work that I've been doing and starting to expose it for catalogers, especially to become more familiar with some of the kind of next generation uh, discussions that we're having around how Mark uh, makes the transition into linked data, the semantic web, bib frame, is through this tool set called Mark Next. And, and this will be something that we'll talk about in a, in a different webinar, at least very briefly. Uh, Mark Next provides a number of different functionalities, but one specifically around the RDF support is, is this idea of using it to uh, demonstrate what MARC records might look like when processed through a transformation to bib frame, uh, what that looks like in an RDF context. And so these are kind of the, the four XML support areas that MarkEdit currently supports right now. And they branch off into supporting other functionalities, but these groups are, are kind of the large groups. And so today I'm going to talk specifically about one and two, um, how we work with um, XML tools to take data into and out of MARC, uh, just, just as for context. All right, so the MARC added XML framework. So the, the MARC added XML framework was developed somewhere in the neighborhood, I think it, it first made its appearance somewhere in the neighborhood around 2000, 
two or three ish, if I had to make a guess. I'm, I'm, it's been a while, so I'm, I'm not positive exactly when that happened, but I think that was about right, sometime around 2002 or three. And the framework's loosely based on research that John Ockerbloom did in his thesis, mediating among diverse data formats. And there's a link to his thesis page as well as um, information about how he went about his process and the thesis document itself if you're interested in reading it. Um, John's work is specifically uh, tied to binary formats. The general gist is that, that uh, you should be able to create some kind of a system that uh, if registered knows how to move from one metadata form one met one data format to another without actually having to know all of the ways that uh, you process the, without having to know an exact path on how to get there. So conceptually, he was dealing with binary data, at least through most of his theses. And so uh, that would be something like saying, I have, a, I have a TIFF file, but ultimately I would like to get to a uh, bitmap file. So within my, my application, what are the conversions that I would need to go through to get from here to there? So that might mean taking that TIFF and transferring it to a PNG file, which might then transfer to a JPEG file, and then transferring to a, uh, a bitmap. Now that's not uh, always efficient, and within binary formats, um, there are pathways that would lead to poor conversions, but there's a, an acceptable amount of data lost in a binary format uh, that when you're doing conversions tends to be okay. Within metadata, that's uh, not quite um, not quite as, uh, as as true, and and really not quite as true when you consider that probably the most common metadata format that you find transformations for is moving from something to Dublin Core, um, and if Dublin Core is going to be somewhere in that transformation queue, all hope is lost uh, because <laughs> you're going to lose a lot of metadata in the process. So when I started thinking about how this this framework might work. Um, I tried to design the way that Mark Edit's transformation worked around a couple of principles. Uh, one of them is that conversions needed to be reusable. I really liked that that concept within this this type broker model that John had had discussed, where conversions were one to one. That that wasn't the preferred way of doing it. I, I don't. want to be an expert in both FGDC and mods and have to create a conversion that goes from one to another. Um, second principle is that uh, the shortest path between two formats, at least within a library content, tends to be Mark XML. Um, the concept of a type broker model um, included this idea that you could have a control framework that would be used to help to um, move data from one format to another. That way you would have to just know how to transfer into that control format and out of, and that potentially could simplify the process of doing data transformations. Since Dublin Core tends to be the control format that gets used in a lot of these transformations, and I didn't want to use it within MarkEdit, I've kind of decided that Mark XML is my control format. And the reason I use that is because while most people tend to think of Mark XML in terms of Mark 21, Mark XML is actually quite flexible. Um, it supports Unimark and it supports other flavors of Mark. And just like the Mark framework, if you understand how the control fields work, um, you actually have the capability of including lots of indicators and lots of subfields and, and making subfield links different. There's, there's actually a, a bit of flexibility there. And so, to make things, uh, to make, because of the way that the library metadata tends to work, for, for me personally, I found that through some, some testing and, and kind of experimentation, the Mark XML tended to capture that data. So, so within the framework, the shortest path between two formats is Mark XML. And then the other one around the principles, I cannot be the bottleneck. So um, in thinking about how to, to build Mark Edit's framework, I originally considered creating um, transformations that were, were compiled libraries. Uh, and that would make a lot of sense from a speed perspective. The challenge with that is then I am the bottleneck because that means that I have to likely build these things or provide um, uh, source code so people can replicate them. And that is uh, 
something that some people will do, but it, it tends to put a barrier up for a lot of folks. Uh, Mark at its plugin framework, for example, has been open and available for a very long time. And there are people that create plugins that they can use with Mark Edit. I hear about it every now and again, but it's definitely a bottleneck. I tend to be the one that uses it uses that framework most often. So I wanted to design this in a way that I wasn't the bottleneck, which means meant making some making some uh some some um, um some compromises. So one of those being that if, if XSLT is going to be the, the the way that transformations happen, there would end up being um some scaling issues, especially when you start working with data that gets into the hundreds of megabytes um or gigabytes for that matter. Um, and, and that just tends to be the way that it works. So you, uh, when you work with really large data sets, you tend to want to break them down. But I, I think that's true of any XML data set you work with. Um, anytime you work with, with XML processing, uh, smaller chunks is generally better. When I think of the Mark Edit XML framework, I think of it like a bicycle tire. And I'm a cyclist, so this is how it makes sense. It's kind of this spoke and wheel model. Every transformation exists as a spoke on the wheel. Mark XML sits in the middle. And because every transformation understands how to go to Mark XML and how Mark XML goes back to it, I can, as I add new spokes to the wheel, I can automatically transfer to any of those other formats. So if I want to transfer to FGDC from Dublin Core, I don't have to know how that works because Dublin Core is on my wheel and FGDC is on my wheel. All I have to do is just connect the two. Um, likewise, if I want to go from EAD to Mark, again, they're just spokes on the wheel. So as I add new elements to that, I'm able to um, take advantage of that. Um, unfortunately, uh, what I and this is part of the reason of me not being a bottleneck, some of these formats aren't... Um, aren't set up in a way that you can just create them once and they're done. Double Core is a great example of that. And we can talk about this when we look at OAIPMH. When you're working with an institutional repository, for example, in theory it all should look the same, but we be, because we implement uh, Double Core and the data that we put into it slightly different, um, what ends up happening is MarkEdit provides a template for how to work with Dublin Core, but even in something like that, you're probably going to be making small tweaks. So when I show you my my version of Mark Edit, you'll see that there are sometimes multiple flavors of Dublin Core that have been created that tie to maybe specific collections that implement the standard in a very specific way. And that's that's partly a, a, my hope is that by using this model that allows that kind of work to happen a little bit easier since there tends to be so much squishiness between some of these metadata formats. All right, so when you work with MarkEdit uh, XML conversions, as you create them, uh, they become available in different places in the application. So you register new XML formats, and we're going to go through this process in a second, through the Mark Tools window, and I, that's the window on the left. Uh, and as you register one, it shows up in that functions list. The top four functions are the functions we talked about last week, the Mark Breaker, Mark Maker, the Mark 21 to Mark XML, and the Mark 21 XML to Mark 21 translations. Those are hard-coded, and those are developed to be fast. Uh, everything below that are, are XML, are generally XSLT or XQuery functions um, that uh, make use of that XML framework. And as they're registered into the Mark Tools window, they're available in other places. So this batch processing tool, this is a tool that you can use to batch process entire folders of data. And as you can see in the drop-down box here that I've kind of snapshotted, everything that's registered within the Mark Tools functions is available here to be able to use. So it, as you make MarkEdit aware of how to translate data from one format to another, that information bubbles into other parts of the application, allowing you to make use of it. The other thing I'm trying to do is I'm trying to encourage people to share their translations. And this has been um, only relatively uh, successful, although it makes it easier for me to to share things when people ask for them. Uh, so, and I'll show you again where this is. So there's the editing window on the left, which is how MarkEdit adds, deletes, modifies new XML functions. And we'll go through that step step process in a second. Uh, 
But there's also a set of, as, as I create new XSLT functions that I think would be generally useful, um, I try and add them to a, 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 um, a repository that then I can query and, uh, and also then uh, make available just for download for people if they want to use them. So this is a way to be able to pull uh, XSLT queries, uh, XSLT translations down. So um, we'll look at them here in a second, but I have some that deal with archival where um, I don't, I think the EAD one is probably for um, creating uh, analytics, uh, Mar uh, innovative triple I XML to MARC, mods to RDF, Onyx, Project Gutenberg data, as well as ProQuest dissertation uh, uh, XML format. So there are theses and dissertation formats. So there are different crosswalks that exist that you can make use of um, in working with the tool. Okay, so here's the the uh, window. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to bounce out of this and I'm going to uh, actually walk through the process so you can see um, how this works. We can talk a little bit more closely about what's going on. Um, make sure here that, okay, good, you can see that. Make sure you can, I can see, all right, great, I, I can see what you can see. Okay, so when you're editing um, new XML functions, uh, the way that this works is you go into the Mark Tools window. So that gets you to um, the place where these are get registered. Uh, we go to Tools, Edit XML Function List, the list here. So these are all the ones that have been registered into MarkEdit that I've registered into my version of MarkEdit. When you install MarkEdit on your own for the first time, I think, I can't remember, um, but I think there's somewhere in the neighborhood of five or six translations that go in. Um, I'd have to look. I haven't. I I, I just I don't remember what's there. But there's a, a list of functions that get at gets added. So let's say I wanted to collect something that's not in this list. So there's a search button here. This is where I would love to be able to have folks provide um, crosswalks that they've worked on. Right now the crosswalk list is pretty small, so I can just hit the view all crosswalks. And this is where you can see the translations that have been worked on. So the archival where the EAD analytics one, the Mark Triple I, the Triple I XML, and I can view them. So I can go ahead and click on it, and this will let me see. Uh, if it'll let me load it. Let me check a different one here. I'm not sure if this is going to cause a problem with the. Let me grab this one. You know, so it's not gonna it's not gonna render it in a pretty way that I'd like it to. Anyways, so that's where they're at. So I can select them and I can download these to my desktop, and then I can register them into Mark Edit. Um, if I was, uh, if it, one of the things that actually might make sense would be to make that process a little bit more straightforward, so you don't have to go through a download step, maybe an automatic installation step. Maybe that's something I'll have to add. But for now, the workflow is: I would select an item, I would download it and then I would register it into the program. And for the purposes of MarkEdit, I'm going to step out for a minute just so you can see, MarkEdit keeps its XSLT data in an XSLT folder. So I have these application shortcuts. You can jump to where the XSLT data is. And you're going to find if you go there that there's a lot of XSLTs that I provide that I don't register. And I do that partly so that you can have templates that I've been working on. Um, for myself or for other people, just so you can start seeing what's been worked on and, and if there's things there that you find useful, you can go ahead and use. Uh, so let's go back to this process. So let's say I, I'm going to go ahead and just open one of these so we can look at uh, what actually happens when you, um, when you add one. All right, so steps that we go through is there's an XML function name, so that's the alias. So that's what's going to show up in all of your lists. You really want that to be unique. Um, if you look at my list and my program page here, you're going to see that I have done a poor job of doing that, which is problematic. Sometimes I can't remember which one of these, what a function does, and I'll have to go back and I'll have to change it or delete it and rebuild it. Uh, you really want those to be unique. <laughs> so in this case, mine is onyx to mark, and so in the function list and everywhere else, that's where I'm, what I'm going to see. Uh, there's the XSLT path, style path, so this is the path where that style sheet lives. Um, so this is my development machine, so it's living in a location that is off in my cloud space. Um, for most users, this is probably going to be in their programs directory or wherever it is they've, they've added it. Uh, 
Now, MarkEdit has to be told a little bit about what you're doing because it doesn't actually know, based on the XSLT, what uh, it needs to be doing with the data. Uh, and what I mean by that is when you're dealing with MARC data, specifically binary MARC data, you can't work with XSLT on its own. Um, our binary MARC data is something that you can generate with an XSLT processor. It's not something you can read. So what MARC edits doing here is it is um, taking the XML framework and it, then it's um, handing off some of the processes to the MARC engine to handle those binary processes. So what I'm doing here when I when I set the format information, I tell MARC edit is the original format, the format that I'm starting with, is it MARC, is it MARC XML, or is it something else? And based on the answer that I give there, MARC edit will do a little bit different things. We'll do a little bit something different. So if it's a mark data, it's going to start with that kind of helper set of processes, translate the data in the background to mark XML, and then hand it off to the framework to do the finished translation. And that finished translation then is what's the final format? Will the final format be mark, mark XML, or something else? And again, if it's something else, the assumption is that that XSLT is going to output it to the final format. If it's MARC XML, MARC edit will translate that data back into MARC XML. If it's MARC, then it takes that data and it translates it into that binary MARC format. Two options below there. One is to convert to MARC 8. So MARC edit prefers all data to be in Unicode. In fact, it tries to force data into Unicode when possible. Um, so if you want your data into MARC 8, you have to tell it. So you would check that box and tell it to convert the data to MARC 8 with the assumption that the data that it's working with by source is um, Unicode data. The other one is to res uh, resolve remote entities. And what this is, is this would be things there in an XML file. You can have links to schemas, to DTDs, to it, files that are included as part of that, uh, as part of that XML file. What MarkEdit does by default is it does not resolve those entities. And the reason for that is, uh, this is especially true of EAD. When you create an EAD file, uh, especially when you were using D using DTDs, those DTDs would exist in a folder that wouldn't travel with the, the ETD file. And so when they would show up in the cataloger's office, that file wouldn't be available, so they would always fail. So by default, MarkEdit just assumes that you have structurally, that your, your data um, conforms to whatever schema or validation file that you're working with, and it works from that point validating then based on structure and then processing based on the XSLT. Um, so that's, but if you need to resolve to remote entities or you want to force schema validation, you can check that box. Um, and then finally, the XSLT engine, this is where you can determine by translation whether you use the default engine, which is set in the preferences, the XSLT mark engine, which is the one that I told you is kind of defined for special use, uh, you know, faster processing but has limitations in that it's XQuery um, and XSLT 1.0, or the Saxon.NET process, which provides um, support to the, the more um, uh, modern XSLT um, and XQuery forms. So that's the, that's the process for setting this up. When you're done, you tell it OK. Um, that data gets loaded into this functions list. And then when I'm done, that list gets resorted and it's sorted alphabetically in order so that uh, the data that I'm looking at um, shows up. So if I look at, for example, um, some data here, I have a, a couple pieces of data uh, just to show you kind of how this works. So one of them is, is an Onyx file. I have my, my Onyx data. There are many different ways that Onyx data can be produced. Um, this one uh, has the uh, contributor as well as the um, uh, uh, numerical labels. Um, so MarkEdit has an Onyx file for an, an Onyx translation that you can download. Um, I can go ahead and select that Onyx file here, uh, drag it into my translation. Uh, this goes to Mark, so I have to. I want to change the name here to MRC, and I go ahead and execute that file. And it takes it a second uh, while it goes through. Um, what's doing is it's validating uh, the MARC file and loading the XSLT and compiling it. Uh, when doing translations, um, the process is slowest when dealing with one record. But as you work with more records, um, the 
the initial cost happens when it compiles that data, so it makes the transformation more efficient. So if you're working with a, a file with lots of records, it becomes faster as it goes through the file, but that, that first record has the cost. So in this case, if I look at my mark records here, I might go ahead and pop this open and execute it. You can see that the, uh, the this is what gets generated from that Onyx record, um, so I can have that there. Uh, same thing is true of working with EAD records. This is the EAD3 test record. Um, it's for Salazar Slytherin. Um, uh, Mark edits uh, XSLT for EAD, um, does a pretty good job processing EAD3, although there's some work that needs to still be done. So um, I can go ahead and check my EAD file, grab my EAD3 file, drop it into the location, take a look here and go and translate it. And we have a much faster translation this time uh, because the process that um, does the, comp the compilation has been done once. Edit it, and then we can look and see. Whoops, that's uh, hit the button too many times. And we can see here that um, the file's been translated into whatever various uh, pieces it's there. So that's how the XML framework works. Let me go back to my slides here. So I have to pick up the pace. All right, exporting tab delimited formats. Um, I'm going to touch on this just very quickly, um, but I want to let you know that Mark Edit, uh, this gets asked every now and again. There is not a magic button that you just push and exports everything to, e to Excel. Um, I thought about doing it. I've been told that there were old tools that did it, but I haven't come up with a good way to do it that supports records at scale. So what I have is I have a tool that allows you to ex decide what fields, subfields, or positions you want to export, normalize the data, and then create repeating fields. So um, this is what it looks like. I'm going to just quickly walk you through that process because I want to get to the delimited tab translator, which is probably what most people will be using most often. But um, open the tool. Um, you're going to find it under Tools, Export, Tab Delimited Records. Um, just need to select the file you're working with. In this case, I've got my MARC file. Um, I'm going to export it. Uh, I prefer using tab delimited, but you can use whatever you want. This is an in-field delimiter. Excel has the ability to take fields that are delimited themselves and break them into multiple columns. So say I know I'm going to have some repeated data. Um, I can go ahead and select my fields that I want to work with. So one, um, I can do uh, positions. So I can take position, say, 5 and 4 bytes. Um, that's the length, uh, position 5, uh, the length of 4 bytes. And then I can take a title, 245, subfield A, or I can take the entire field um, without uh, mentioning a subfield and just say I want that whole thing. I can normalize the data, which is um, nice for subfield, or uh, nice for um, working with uh, Subject data, if I need to delete something, I can put it there and then delete the field if I have to so I can put it back in place. So that's my stuff. I have settings here so I can save this um, export settings. So let's say I need to export the same data over and over and over again. I can save this list so when I come back in, I can just reload the list and not have to deal with it again. Um, but this is all I need to do. And then when I'm done, I can export the data. And it's finished. It exports that data for me. And so now I have a delimited list um, in tab delimited format uh, here that I can load into Excel. Um, you can see how it gets exported. Uh, so that's that can now be worked with and loaded into Excel. And you can see here. For um, subjects, this is what I mean by normalization. Subfield codes are normalized, normalized into dashes. So that's my uh, my record set there. Let me go ahead and continue here because I think this is the one I get asked about most often and the one that people most often end up using. Um, this is the limited text translator. Uh, this allows you, uh, one of the things that surprises me still is how much data we have that's in um, spreadsheet formats or how much data we get from vendors that are in Excel files. So this allows you to take data that's in Excel formats or in limited formats and translate it into MARC. This is actually really handy if you pair it with the merge tool that we talked about in the first webinar for taking data, um, creating simplified records, and then merging it with existing records. So you can take that data and merging it into an existing file set and then reloading it into your 
um, ILS. So uh, limited files supported, uh, tab, comma, piped, and custom, Excel 2000 to present, that means binary and XML formats, um, Access 2000 to present, binary and XML formats, supports Unicode data, and I'm going to explain what that means because if you're working with Excel, you have to check this button because Excel does some wonky, Excel and Access does some wonky, wonky things with Unicode. Um, the feature set supported, you can create constant data either as its own line or as part of an existing field. You can join data together. Um, you can have it work on non-filing data. There's a list of data elements that it looks for for generating non-filing. Um, indicators within the 245, and I'm expanding that list. Right now, it's primarily um, English-based non-filing characters, but I'm sp expanding it to include um, uh, the, um, some foreign language non-filing character data sets. Uh, you can have templates, so you can create templates. You can also auto-generate your field mappings, so if in your Excel sheet or your delimited format, you create what those mappings are supposed to look like in the first column. Um, those can be used to automatically generate your field mappings within the tool. Uh, this is the format field, subfield, and then indicators, and then any punctuation you want at the end of that line. Uh, fields and subfields are repeatable or not. This is what it looks like, but I'm going to go ahead and just show you how this works. I have some examples. These are excruciatingly simple examples because um, going through this process, uh, with large data sets um, is, is sometimes takes a while. I just I'm going to go ahead and work with small, simple data sets. So what I did is I created a, an Excel file um, just so you can see how this works. There are two Excel files. We'll start with this one. This Excel file um, has just some very sample data. It's a, a last name, first name, so I know those two data elements need to be combined. Best title and a description. So. Um, when I work with this, I will go ahead and select that file. So it defaults to text, but I'm going to grab an XML file uh, or an Excel file. I'm going to save it as an Excel. This is not going to be an auto-generated list. I'm going to generate this one myself. Excel sheet name. Excel in Windows, there's a, a driver that gets used to to provide support for Excel uh, transformations. And within um, that driver, it treats an Excel sheet like a database. So when it says sheet name, what it's asking for is it's asking for this data element down here, the sheet one, two, three. Um, that piece of element, that piece of data sometimes gets customized into something else that people change the name to. Um, for me, this is going to be sheet one. Uh, that's what I need to enter here, and that allows MarkEdit to know which sheet you're working with. Um, that helps. Um, you have some options for editing globally the LDR and the 08. This is what MarkEdit uses by default. Um, you can select um, a particular material type if you know that's what you're going to be working with. You can tell MarkEdit this is a Unimark data, which has some specific um, implications around how it sets data for Unicode. Uh, marking as well as a few other things. I'm not going to make any changes. Because I'm working with an Excel data sheet, I have to check UTF-8 encoding. And the reason for that is Excel saves data in what's called UTF-8-32. Um, that is a Unicode format that is not valid in MARC. Um, it's actually uh, not valid in, in any of our library work. And so what MarkEdit does when it checks that is it looks for two things. One is um, the Unicode encoding level so that it can convert it to UTF-8 if need be. And one is just uh, opens file streams so that they're UTF-8 aware. So if you're working with Excel or Access Data, always check UTF-8 because the data is like, if the data is being stored in Unicode, which it probably will be. Um, if you're working with data that you know is Unicode enabled, go ahead and check that button. It, it helps mark edit, even though it doesn't necessarily need to be there, but just a good practice. If you know your data is in Unicode in some flavor, check that box. Go ahead and tell it to go to next. It reads the fields, and it takes the first data field and puts it in place. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do some simple mappings, 100 subfield A, indicators. We'll just make some up. Actually, let's and keep them blank just for the heck of it. And then I've got it. I'm going to tell it, I know there's no comma. This is just a subfield. I add my comma, add argument. I'm going to go ahead and field two. It's going to be again into the subfield A. Um, create at the end. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a title 245. Oops. Field 245, subfield A. 
I'm going to put indicators there, but I'm going to I'm kicking, checking this uh, calculate common non-sorting. So really, the indicator stuff doesn't matter because it's going to calculate that on its own. Three is going to be a 500 field, um, and I forgot the subfield. Subfield A. Uh, I'm going to assume the punctuation right, and then I'm going to create a constant data element just for the fun of it. Um, I don't have to select a field. Um, you, you used to have to select a field. I'm going to create a new field. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say 999 uh, subfield A. This is my constant data field that all gets put there. Indicators. Um, I check that this is a constant data field, and I add the argument. Now, Mark Edit by default creates every field within its own. It's a new field for every argument. But the 100 fields need to be paired together. So I'm going to select these two elements, right click on them, and join the items. So now the items are joined, um, and I'm done. So this is a template here. I can check this. If I know I'm going to have to use this over and over again, I can check this. It'll save that as a template. I don't need to. I'm going to only do this once. Finish, and it's done. So now I can go over to my, my file here and see the auto-generated file stuff. This is the header. No, this isn't, this isn't the header. It skipped the header. So here's my, my data. You can see um, fields are joined together. Uh, for some odd reason, my constant data isn't there. So I have to take a look at why that didn't show up. But anyways, um, maybe, that's a, maybe I've run across a bug or I don't know. I'll have to look at it and see why that didn't work. Constant data should have showed up, but it didn't. Uh, I will deal with that. But this, you can see how the data gets joined together. You can see the, the fields, the indicators, and whatnot. And also do, um, uh, uh, you can also do this so that it can load with a um, with uh, auto generate stuff. So I'll just quickly auto generate uh, really quickly. Excel sheet and look at it. Um, the Excel sheet is basically the same. Uh, it's running slow for a minute. Maybe I didn't click the button. There we go, I did click the button. So you can see that the first column doesn't have data, but instead has these arguments. If I click auto generate, it auto generates the argument list. Um, and then I can finish and Rather than having to go through and define all those up front, um, because I auto generate, because I created those arguments in the list, they're in here. So um, that's my uh, auto generated list. Uh, when you do an auto generated list, I'll just point this out. Um, to join elements, you put these asterisks. Um, asterisk level, so one asterisk within these two, that tells me that field joins together. If I wanted to join, uh, let's say another 500 field. Say I had these two and I wanted to join these together. Um, I would put two asterisks next to them because that tells me that is its own unique field group. So hopefully that's that makes sense. Um, so that's that is how that works. And I'll take a closer look at the constant data uh, to see why in the world that didn't work. Should have. <clears throat> All right, I see we're getting close, running out of time. I want to, um, I guess, uh, oh, that's right. I forgot to add the, OK, just one second. Okay. Okay, set my slides here. And go to one more slide. Uh, so MarkEdit has the ability to break data into databases. There's the Mark XML Explorer. Um, by default, it supports two database types, uh, SQLite, which is what it uses to break them in by default, and then MySQL supported, and it can read from remote databases. Uh, so let me just quickly show you what this is, and, and we'll break a database real fast. Um, so within the tool, uh, you find it under add-ins, Mark SQL Explorer, shows this piece, this, uh, this handy dandy little uh, tool. Um, we select the file that we want to work with. I'm going to grab this uh, file here. Go ahead and grab this file here. Um, I'm going to create a database. And this is going to be a, a SQLite database. 
There are two versions. One is a simple schema, which is basically just a control table and then a fields table. One is the next is an expanded table schema. I'm going to use that because that seems to be the one that um, makes it easiest to do the kind of um, analysis you might be interested in. Process it. It goes ahead and processes the data. Um, I will load that database. And then you have this option here where you can look at the table structure so that you know how you're going to work with the data. So. In this case, the control database is called MarkDB. Um, this database has a primary key, a title, um, and then Mark record data. Primary key links to all of this other element data. So we have a primary key, a field key, fields, indicators uh, within these data elements. So uh, C ID matches the ID in the database. So um, if I go to the SQL, I can run a, a run a, a database query, and it'll return back um, data elements here. So I can see the title of my data, and I get the marked data that's here. Um, I can run queries that are uh, more complicated. Um, I'm not going to run anything super specific here. Um, our table, so T1. See if we can find stuff with the in it. Ah, syntax error. Okay, I should have put it. Um, I'll just dump it real quick. That way, I don't have to quickly put it in. There. So you can see here the kind of data that's shown. We get the ID for the um, uh, record. The field ID, so the reason why that is there is it breaks down the subfields. You can query by a field ID, a subfield, the indicator values in the field, and then the uh, entire field data. So you can see um, what's there. So it's, it's actually a pretty interesting tool. This was designed specifically um, to help with some data crunching um, with Hattie Trust data that was uh, difficult to do at the time. It's getting easier to do with the uh, research center that's being put up, but um, that's kind of what's there. And let's see here. I think that uh, takes us to the end here. So um, that's uh, additional helpful questions. We have the YouTube videos still um, and the listserv. You're always uh, free to ask questions. Um, are there, are, have, it looks like 12 minutes. Um, so are there any, uh, Questions that have come up. Let me see if I can see here. Okay. All right. So, if, does anybody have any specific questions about the uh, 